Welcome everybody. This is our first edition of the Reproducible Research Study Group podcast. It's uh, very much experimental, so I hope you will bear with us uh, uh, for any glitches. This is uh, uh, coming to you, uh, most probably unedited because nobody has time to do that. So this is just us, row and ready to talk to you. I'm Francesco Santini. Uh, I'm uh, here with the Reproducible Research Study Group Committee uh, Florian Knoll, Nicolas Tikov, uh, Shahan Malik, uh, Efrat Shimron, and uh, MRM Highlights, uh, Mathieu Boudreau, to talk together with uh, Adrienne Campbell and uh, Michael Hansen uh, about uh, um, raw data standards and specifically the ISMRM raw data format. Um, it's based on uh, uh, a paper that came out a few years ago, uh, where uh, Michael and Adrienne are uh, co-authors, but we will talk in general about many things. So I would like uh, uh, to ask uh, Adrienne first and then uh, Michael to introduce themselves, and we are very excited to have you here. Thank you for joining. Well, thank you for inviting me to be here. I am a researcher at the National Institutes of Health. I have a lab that develops methods for imaging the heart and imaging the lungs and performing MRI-guided cardiac interventions. And we focus a lot on using spiral imaging for SNR efficiency and speed. And when we're developing our new reconstruction methods, we deploy them using computationally efficient methods that integrate into the clinical workflow. And in order to achieve all that, we rely a lot on the ISMRM raw data format that we're going to be talking about today. And, and hi, I'm, I'm Michael Hansen. I'm, uh, thanks for, for having me here. Very excited to be here. This is a topic that's very uh, close to my heart, so excited to be here. Uh, I am a researcher as well at Microsoft. Uh, I've been at Microsoft for about four years and change, but prior to that, I was like a proper academic. Uh, uh, with a with a lab and that sort of thing, and that uh, it was it was in that context that we we started uh, the uh, ISMRM raw data format. So I hope to talk a little bit more about that. I think I also originally started the reproducible research study group, uh, so I have a little bit of a history with this group. So it's just excited to uh, to be, be be here and talk to you guys. Welcome, Michael. And uh, curious, what made you leave academia? <laughs> wow, that was not what I was prepared to talk about today. But uh, I had a, I had a, a, a slight, uh, let's call it a, a midlife crisis or something. Uh, I wanted to uh, try something else in in uh, in my career, and um, and uh, I'd always wanted to go make software in industry. It was I had this urge to go and do that, and I didn't quite know how to do it, so I decided to uh, uh, to to break with academia. And I actually went and did something completely different than Microsoft. My first year at Microsoft, I, I did not uh, touch anything research related. I was out working with customers in the field and learned a lot. I also worked on a product team for a couple of years, but, um, but now I've sort of returned a little bit more to my roots and I'm doing research again uh, uh, in a, in a, with a slightly different goal, but, but it's, it's related as well. And we're also using the, uh, the, the raw data standards. So I, I sort of get to do both. I get to be a little bit of an academic, but I also get to make software in industry. So I, I think that's a good fit for me. I'm glad that we ambushed already uh, our guests with, uh, with an unexpected question. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's, uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about the ISMRM uh, raw data format, uh, uh, which is uh, one of your... Uh, many projects, the very successful projects. Um, so first of all, um, what is the ISMRM raw data format? And is ISMRM RD even the right name? I heard something. Yeah, so, so Adrian, I, I can maybe start with this and then hand off, off to Adrian and just say a little bit about how this this came about and why it's, uh, why it's called that and maybe why, why that was a poor choice of name or something, you know, since nobody can pronounce it. But but the uh, the origin story of this was actually um, several years ago we were preparing for uh, one of Jim Pipes uh, image reconstruction workshops in Sedona and we wanted to make it a big theme that we would share uh, reconstruction software at this and everybody would show up and it would all be a big hackathon or something. But then we realized as we were preparing this that in order to uh, share software, the only meaningful way to do that is if you have a common understanding of what raw data actually looks like. And so it very quickly 
took a turn in this uh, planning committee for the conference that uh, that we needed to figure out how this raw data would look like. And we had just at the time started this other project that maybe we'll, we'll touch on a little bit later called the Gadgetron, which was a re reconstruction engine, uh, but used its own sort of internal contract for what data should look like. And so I took uh, on in the, in the context of, of organizing that workshop, a, a way to come up with a, with a more sort of general standard for how we represent raw data so that we could primarily so that we could share code because if we don't have a contract of what the data looks like we can't uh, share the code and because this was done for an ISMRM workshop we ended up calling it the ISMRM raw data format and that's why it's called ISMRM RD uh, and that you know name was seem natural at the time it's just sort of stuck but of course it doesn't exactly just roll off the tongue and uh, and and so maybe it's a little bit awkward. So I think there's like been a consensus now in the community around this that we should really just have called it MRD for MR data. Uh, and, and also because there are other things than raw data that you, you actually need to represent at the same time, things like waveforms, which is very relevant for Adrian, but also images that come out of it. So it's really more than just case-based data. There's a whole, it's all the data that's associated with an MR experiment. And it's probably not, uh, you know, restricted to imaging either. It could be for spectroscopy as well. So I think there's a consensus that probably we should have called it MRD. And maybe that's the way it will go. But of course, there are many, many references in code and documentation and papers and all that stuff that use that original name. So I suspect it will be with us for a little bit. But if you hear the term MRD and ISMR MRD, they're really the same thing. Uh, whereas the latter, the MRD, is probably what we should have called it. Uh, I advocate so, for the MRD name change and rebranding. I find yeah. I MRD hard to type over and over again, but yeah. we're working on it. We'll get there. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. We should. And and um, so I don't know, Adrian, do, do you want to say a little bit about, um, you know, because you guys are, you're both involved in the standard, but you're also heavy users, right? Uh, and, and so who are the people using it in the lab? What's, good about it, tough about it, you know, what needs to be done, stuff like that. Yeah, sure. So uh, the MRD format contains, as Michael said, basically everything you need to do an imagery construction. So it tells you about your experiment in an XML header. It stores the data readout by readout. It has this waveform data type that can contain physiological waveforms or gradient waveforms, or perhaps in the future, things like field monitoring equipment or fMRI stimuli data. There's a lot of flexibility there. It has metadata that can store contours and data labels, and it has an image format so that once you've reconstructed, you can actually save and view your image. So there's a lot to this data format, which makes it really versatile when it comes to deploying it for research. The other thing that's good about it is it uses the HDF5 uh, common data format, meaning that it's pretty straightforward to adopt. You can use standard tools in MATLAB and Python or custom viewing tools that we've made available. But that makes it really easy for researchers to, to get started using that data format. In terms of how people are using it, I think there are kind of two use cases that I see. One is people who convert their data to the MRD format in order to store it to some time later, be able to go back and reconstruct it and basically recreate that experiment and maybe change their uh, reconstruction code and change what they're doing with the data. Um, and because it's vendor agnostic, uh, they can store data from different platforms and different software versions and have it all in the same format. And then the other use case is people who are using tools like the Gadgetron reconstruction engine who are streaming this uh, data format. So they're streaming data line by line, um, along with all of the extra information to a reconstruction engine to reconstruct their data within the context of a clinical exam. So actually doing, doing the reconstruction in real time during the exam. So I think those, those are sort of the different ways that people are using this data format. And actually, it's very interesting that you say we can store our data there, but uh, I, I would be, I have to say, I'm, I used it uh, very, very little, uh, but uh, I, I would be a bit uh, worried that uh, some data that are stored in my Siemens uh, proprietary format would be lost when I translate it into ISMRMRD. How uh, do I need to worry or uh, 
it's uh, yeah i'm i mean i i think you should always worry about data loss right that's that's that that should be in a in a that should be our default position to be worried about that but but i'll say there are actually there, there's a really important philosophical difference between this data format and the data format that the vendors provide so typically if you pick up a vendor uh, data file or data files, depending on how it's structured, what would be in there, and that goes for the Siemens uh, data as well, is some kind of protocol. Like, uh, but that protocol actually captures what kind of buttons were pressed. What did the user select? Did they like select partial Fourier, and was it a strong or a weak filter? And did they do this or that and the other? So these are actually a number of. Uh, the, that protocol is a reflection of what the user set up that the user did to, to, uh, to, to start the experiment. But that doesn't actually capture what experiment took place, right? So this is really, really, really important, right? So the experiment that took place could be the same protocol could actually lead to two different raw data set depending on what sequence that runs it. That in general, and, and hopefully most of the time, if I pick up like a Siemens raw data set and I look at the protocol, I can figure out what actually happened in the end and, and what this data is supposed to, uh, what, what the different pieces of data represent. But in general, it's not true. So I would say if you take your raw data from whatever your vendor format is and you successfully and accurately convert it to uh, Eisenberg raw data format, you've actually captured now, you have a better version of the experiment that took place that should set you up better for doing the reconstruction later, as opposed to if you come five years later and you find that GE uh, file, and actually you have no clue what happened, right? For some of the vendors, it's partic particularly bad uh, where you can pick up the raw data and unless you actually knew what sequence ran it and what, how under what conditions, like what version of software was it run on and so on, you don't know. There are subtle little details, like when you select partial Fourier, do you round up or down? Like these become important for like, what does your case space look like? If you capture that and convert it to, to Eisenberg or Madi, you actually have a better, more faithful representation of the physics of the experiment that took place and you would be better set up. So, you know, I would say absolutely, you should be concerned about data loss, but you should also be very concerned about actually effectively capturing what experiment took place. And that's what the Eisenberg or the, or MRD, uh, I should say, tries to solve. The other thing I'd point out is uh, we have a series of different converters that take Siemens or Philips or GE or Brooker or whatever data type and convert them into MRD. And those are under our control. So those are all community developed and community driven. And so we're trying to capture all of the parameters that are relevant as you convert your data. But there's, a, there's, again, flexibility there. If there's particular parameters that are important to you that you have control to make sure that they're being appropriately captured and are presented in the data format. So when it comes to data loss, I, I'd encourage people to have a look at those converters and make sure that you're capturing what you think you are. Yeah. Yeah, no, and, and that actually, um, maybe I can take this as a first segue to do a little bit of advertising here. I, it, there are, as, as Adrian points out, these community uh, converters, and they, they operate usually at a couple of different levels. You mentioned that you might take your raw data, convert it to an ISM or an MRD file, and then, uh, and then use that going forward. But there's also the inline conversion that happens when you're streaming out the, the data. They're, they're very close, closely related, but they may have slightly different flavors to it. But those are maintained by people in the community and not all of them are maintained equally well. Uh, we have to be honest that, uh, that some vendors have uh, they're much better coverage, like in terms of the types of sequences we can convert and so on. Others less so, and that really comes down to who in the community has been involved. So if there's somebody sitting out there with like Philips or Brooker or something that really want to get involved in this, I would you know, highly encourage you to reach out to me or Adrian or somebody else in the, in the community and get involved in this. Uh, because the way that we drive this forward uh, is not by waiting for the vendors to provide us with converters. Um, it's just not on their list of things to do. And so we drive this ourselves. And so the best people to drive that are people that use those vendors dated every day, right? And, and, and have a feel for what the data is supposed to look like. So if you're at all just a little bit interested, 
uh, please join us and, and, and help out with this stuff. That would be great. I, I think Effort wanted to say something. Yeah. Yeah, so I have a question. Let's say a new person is interested in getting involved and he, he or she wants to start working with the new form with this format. What are the tools that are available to them? Where can they find these converters? Yeah, so Adrian, do you want to say a little bit about where we have our stuff? Sure. So, I mean, I'll start off and then hand over to you. So we have a Git repo that contains uh, the ISMRM RD code as well as code for data conversion and a few different viewing tools for MATLAB and Python and a custom viewer uh, that we've developed. There's different examples of how to use the tools from that 2017 MRM publication. And there's been a lot of a lot more examples developed over the last few years. But I, I have to say, I think the documentation needs some updating and consolidating some of those examples. So that's definitely something on our radar. So for people who are newly getting started, I think the best place to start is looking at that Git repo. But keeping in mind what we just said, that the, the converters have been uh, developed by different people in the community. And so if you have a new application, uh, you may need to do a little bit of work to make sure that those converters are, are working appropriately for you. Yeah. Michael, did you want to add something? Yeah, so, so I want to say that on, on GitHub, GitHub is sort of organized into organizations uh, that have individual repositories. Uh, and there is an ISMRM RD. Uh, I guess we have to rename that org maybe or something, but that's that's what it's called, uh, organization that, that manages a number of repositories. The main repository is the one called ISMRM RD, which basically specifies the standard, right? There, there we have header files and things like that that lay everything out. We have some testing and stuff that shows how to read and write this from files and so on and so forth. So that's like the main repository. There is also uh, that repository uh, historically also contains the MATLAB code, which pro should probably have been in a separate repository, but it, it lives in there with the C++ and C code. So that's C, C++, MATLAB APIs uh, in there. Then there's a separate Python repository that um, implements the standard in Python. So that gives you some feel for the language coverage that we have, MATLAB, C++, Python, C. These are the languages that you can use to, to work with the, uh, with the data. And, and then in the same organization, we also then have converters for uh, Siemens, GE, Philips, Brooker, I be believe is in there. Uh, so that, uh, that, that's uh, all in there. And there's also the paper, the manuscript for the paper, the original paper is completely open source. It's all written in there. And there are actually scripts that generate all the figures that are in the paper. I haven't run them lately, but the idea is that you should, that was the original reproducible research, uh, you know, paper, if you will, uh, where everything down to the window level settings of the figures as they were typeset or as, as it was said in the paper actually is also in there. And our response to reviewer comments and everything on the paper is also in a repo in there. So all those resources are available uh, to you. Did you actually get consent from the reviewers to publish those comments? No. You just did it? Yeah, I mean, we didn't like lay, I mean, they're anonymous, uh, right? So, so we didn't, uh, and we didn't sort of uh, hang anybody out to dry or anything. We were just, as we edited the manuscript, we put in there, this is response to reviewer one, response to reviewer two, like you would normally do. Uh, and it's in LaTeX, so it's awful and all that. But you know, it, it, well, I shouldn't say that. It's fine, but but it's just like a little gnarly to read. Uh, it's not as as, uh, as as accessible, but it's all in there, uh, which I think is nice uh, and, and and very much in the spirit of how this project uh, came about. Did one of the reviewers just outed himself, uh, Nicola? Is, and did you get actually <laughs> no, no? But I have actually asked for permission to do that on one of my papers, and I didn't get it. So I guess you you do it, and you ask questions later. I think that's the <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I will I will say this is gets into some philosophy here. But a, a younger version of myself was maybe a little bit more uh, uh, brazen, bold, or however you want to put it, than I am now. Uh, but the, you know, one of the questions we had in, in our list of things to talk about was like vendor attitudes towards, towards this. And I think it helped me help the project at the time that I maybe wasn't too, you know, I might, I might have been a little bit less careful uh, than I would be now. And, and, and that actually 
ended up, uh, you know, allowing us to push through some barriers. But so at the time, we didn't even think about it. We just thought this is going to be an open paper. So the only way to do it in the open is to do it in the open. And, and we didn't really think about it. But I wanted to point out in there that new people coming into this uh, project, that all of those resources are captured and available in there. And I, I think that's nice uh, to have. There's a lot to trawl through, right? So don't overwhelm yourself. Go in there and pick and choose what you want to do and then reach out and talk to us if you want to get involved in it. So on the, on the subject of vendors, um, what the question I had actually is that I didn't realize at first that the, the data container also has a full description of the sequencing. So that's, that's a, a very interesting feature. Um, I was wondering if there's like a tension between the sorts of extra parameters and extra bits of information that you can put into this data and um, whether any vendors are worried about some of these extra pieces actually being put in there? Have you ever experienced um, that? Yeah, I, I think we did. I mean, I'll, I'll let you say a little bit, Adrian, but I, I, I can I can say that at the time when we wanted to publish the paper, we felt it was very important to have an initial set of converters that we put, would put out with the paper and say, you can, here's some, if you're on broker, here's where you get started. We didn't want it to be, we didn't have aspirations for it to be complete, but there should be like a scaffold for people to start working on this, on the stuff. And so at the time, the vendor that which I was working with, which shall remain nameless here. Uh, we, I, I, I went to them and I said, listen, we're going to publish this converter. Are you guys okay with it? And they actually were almost like paralyzed. They couldn't really make a decision. And, and in retrospect, I should have been more sympathetic to their position. When you ask a company to take a, here, here's this you know, researcher who says, okay, I'm going to disclose some stuff. And you now have to assess this risk and there's very little benefit to you. It's like a paralyzing experience. You cannot, you know, how can you assess that? What's in it for me? And what we ended up doing was we turned around and said, actually, we have a research agreement with you guys. It says in there, we're supposed to give you a notice. So we gave them 30 days notice. Uh, and in the end, they, they decided not to object and we, we released the... Um, but they got very concerned because there was now this nebulous risk like, what are, what are we disclosing? And some of them, some of the, the concerns that they have were genuine, like maybe for a, a time-resolved uh, or contrast-enhanced angiography, the, uh, the profile ordering is proprietary, right? You could imagine that that, you know, actually matters. And that would be disclosed, right? So that you could actually disclose proprietary information through this uh, data conversion process. And so I think it's important to be like to assume good intentions on both sides, right? Assume that the vendors, when they come and say that they're concerned about this and that they might actually have a point, right? So I think we've gotten better at listening to what it is that their concerns are and then kind of working together on it. But there's been lots of concern along the way that you can in inadvertently, even though we, we put this abstraction, which is a, a vendor neutral format over it, all abstractions leak at some point, as we say, right? Uh, at some point, you're gonna be able to see what's behind the curtain and the vendors get nervous about that. And so there's definitely that in, in this data format. But I think people have gotten better at it. And I think we now know that everybody wants to, to move things forward. And, and I think the vendors also know that there's good things in this for, for them, right? They, it's, a, it's a good way for them to engage with the community. So maybe it's worth the risk, but it takes a little while to build that up. So I don't know. Adrian, you might have some special cases as well for. for yeah, I agree. I think that I have experienced some reluctance from vendors over the years, but I think there's been an evolution in the last few years where vendors see the value of this, the value of allowing their customers to collaborate or deploy their own reconstruction algorithms or come up with um, big data repositories. They're starting to see the value of of data formats like this and are starting to get on board. There are in fact some vendors who are starting to adopt the MRD data format for particular aspects of their products. So, so even though there's usually reluctance and as Michael said, we, we need to take that seriously and have a conversation about it. I do think that there has been an evolution and that the vendors are starting to see the value of this. Yeah, I, maybe I can add to that. I, I'm, I'm sure we've all, I don't know if we all have, but there was a paper, there was an article in Nature here a couple of uh, weeks ago, right, about how um, the NIH will start uh, in January 2023 to require that all grants have a plan 
for data management and that they eventually sh share their uh, their data publicly. Right? It will be a, a requirement for, uh, and I'm sure this will propagate to all uh, funding agencies and so on. So in that kind of environment where, where researchers now have to uh, share their data in, in some form, I think it's actually in the vendor's interest that it is in fact in an abstract vendor neutral format so that they can exactly hide if they if you want to call it that or decide how and how in what way that they disclose things that could be proprietary like a profile order or something that may not be relevant for the particular paper or something but you can then still share the raw data but do it in in this sort of vendor neutral abstract form so i think not only have vendors sort of naturally come around to seeing some advantages in this i think they will maybe be forced or, or not to, to embrace it even further, right? Because it is a way to share data without sharing all your inner workings of your system, right? Uh, which, which actually, most of the time to reconstruct images, you don't need to know, right? You need to know what experiment took place, but you don't need to know all the gory details of how your parameters turned into that sequence. So I think it will we, we will see even more of it. I have one question that I wanted to ask both of you. Could you just give a couple of examples of projects that you are using ISMRM RD for mostly to illustrate, let's say I am a new person and I'm on the verge of uh, thinking, should I use it? Should I not use it? What does it have to offer for me? So can you maybe just give a couple of examples um, what you use it for um, to illustrate its potential and its features. Sure, maybe I can start. So as I mentioned already, I do a lot of non-Cartesian imaging, specifically spiral imaging of the heart and lung. And as everyone knows, when we reconstruct spiral data, it's not a simple FFT, not that any reconstruction is, but um, we, we choose to use the Gadgetron reconstruction engine, which gives us sort of more powerful reconstructions for our non-Cartesian data. But because we're imaging the heart and lung with spirals, there's a lot more information than we need than just case space. So we use the MRD data format to stream the spiral readouts along with the matching gradient waveforms and uh, information to do artifact correction, like the gradient impulse response function, along with physiology information like the ECG and the respiratory waveforms. And so we send all of that um, to our reconstruction engine, the Gadgetron, and get an image back. And so we use MRD to, uh, to, to stream that information. And a lot of our work has been on developing how we send that information, how we receive it, and how we use it in the reconstruction. And so that's sort of our particular area of interest and where we're doing something that I don't think that we could easily do without having a format with the flexibility of MRD. So yeah, I can I can mention a couple of things. Uh, the obvious project right was the Gadgetron, where which actually, for the record, didn't start uh, with the MRD format. It was added on later uh, when we when we did that workshop. But other than that, I can say a little bit, maybe a couple of other examples of of where it's powerful. So my current uh, job, we're we're developing. Uh, so we say platforms, infrastructure, and stuff that allows an, an imaging instrument to be connected to what we would sort of, for practical purposes, consider unbounded computational resources when, when, it, when it's actually running. When we go about as a software company developing this sort of thing, having a contract of sorts of what the data looks like, independent of what vendor might use it, is not just an advantage, it's, it's essential, right, uh, so that we can go uh, about uh, putting these systems together in a way that lots of people would be able to use it. So in, in the context of building software at scale and stuff like that, having a contract and a common understanding of what the what the data looks like it is, is essential. I don't know how we would uh, we would do it otherwise. So that's one example uh, you know of ways to use it. I'll, I'll give another example which I've also used in the past which which uh, is for for teaching purposes. Right. I've done many uh, lectures at the uh, at the ISMRM, usually at 7 a.m. Uh, in a in a dimly lit conference room somewhere, uh, trying to teach new people in the field how to get into image reconstruction. Starting from something like the ISMRM or the MRD format is actually a huge advantage. It means that you can put data in the hands of fairly new people uh, in the field 
here's a file in, in HDF5 format that you can do H5 read in MATLAB, or you can use H5 Pi, you can read it in, you can explore this data and you can understand it without having to worry about how specific user settings on a user interface turns into uh, an actual experiment. So to take in that, out of it and, and starting with the core of the experiment and working on it, I think academically is really powerful. Uh, so, so, you know, I would very much encourage people that, that teach um, at universities and, and stuff that they think about using this sort of format uh, to, to, to bring people in because it, it removes a lot of noise that you otherwise have to deal with. Oh, then I'm reading in my Phillips data and then I have to remember that there's uh, this arbitrary phase that gets added and subtracted and I have to, and so the code is this massive bloated thing that you, you can be a little bit intimidating, right? Whereas if you boil it down to what it actually is, I think it allows, it, it's much better for teaching purposes. So I think for working with prototype or image reconstruction systems like the Gadgeton for building stuff at scale, uh, which is what, what I do now, or for teaching, I think it, it's really uh, something that's very valuable and, and can help you out. So th those would be the, the things that I would, would highlight. I have a question that is actually general and uh, I'm really curious uh, uh, to, to, to know your, uh, your stance on it. Uh, how does a data format become a standard? So you were extremely successful with MRD uh, and uh, I really applaud you for this. Uh, uh, and uh, how, how did you convince people to use it? And then how do you convince everybody almost to, to use it? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't know that we have convinced everybody to, to use it. Uh, and I don't know that everybody uh, you know, uses it right or whatever, if, if, there is a, if there is that. But I would say there's, there's a couple of ingredients. It's interesting because I was just invited a couple of weeks ago to the pet community that are right now in the throes of developing this uh, a standard for pet data. And they were wondering, they were asking exactly the same, how did you manage to be successful with this? I really had to think about this. So, so I think there are, there are a couple of key things here. First is, um, I think it's critical to pick some kind of moment in time where there is a need for it. We picked this workshop, right? That we had to deliver something for. And so there was a deadline we had to get something done and there has to be some kind of foundation for, for things to stand on. There's a tendency for academics to make committees that discuss how to form a committee, to build a consensus, to you know, do something else, and it never really goes anywhere. So having a deadline, a conference that you need to deliver something to is really powerful. And I actually, there's, there's an experience that I have from another field that I think we should pick up in the, uh, so in, in the, in the healthcare interoperability area, you know, exchanging medical records, they had this concept of connectathons, which has driven the, their community forward for, for years. We should have like reconstructathons, right? We get together and then we propose projects and we say, we're all going to get together and we're going to reconstruct this fMRI sequence, or we're going to reconstruct this, or we're going to show how we can use this data from this scanner along with this data from this other scanner. You make a little project, you get together in a room for three days and you hack something together. Those kinds of moments, like a workshop, a, a reconstructathon, if that's the term we coined for it or whatever, can be really important drivers, right? So that's number one, have, have some target to go for. Second is realize that it's gonna be very few people doing this. Don't try to have, expect that 30 people are gonna to get together and write software. It's gonna be like three people. They're going to write most of the software and it's fine. It's okay. Right? You don't have to have everybody writing all the software. It's okay. Few people can write it, but there needs to be a big community that's willing to come in and, and stand behind it when you publish the paper or whatever and say, this is the way forward. Everybody should be. So make sure that you get as many authors on the paper as possible, even if they haven't written a line of code. Uh, you know, because there's more to it than writing code. There's going back to your lab and communicating this there's being bought into it. There's standing up in front of your vendor and saying, you need to support the standard. So having a big community that supports the general idea and thinks it's great what you're doing is a critical thing, but don't expect them to do the work, right? It will be like three people and that's okay. So those would be the three things like pick a date, something important date, right? Uh, or that's what we did that made it work. Uh, and and the, the, um, 
just have a few people write it, it's okay, but then have a big group that's willing to back it up. Uh, and so I think those were the things that made it successful in our case. And I'd maybe add, don't expect it to ever be finished, because I feel like things like this are never truly finished. They're always evolving and adapting to the new state of the art and the new needs. So I don't think you define a format one time and it's finished. I think it's always evolving and growing. Yeah, I think this is like a critical, critical uh, observation, right? If you try to make it perfect, it'll fail. You, you will sit, you will be forever stuck discussing, oh, how do we represent these three parameters that doesn't quite fit in and how can we get it working? So there's this 80-20 rule uh, that we, we apply a lot in software, right? You, write, you do something that works for 80% of the stuff, but then has some quirky dark corners of it where you can make the last 20% work yourself if you need to, right? So that's kind of like... The principle that you need to push forward you 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 have to you know what is it so perfect as the enemy of, of of good or something right you have to just realize it's not going to be perfect there's going to be stuff that is not well represented but go as as fast as you can and then let people that um that are willing to put in the work decide right so you you if they're willing to work hard on getting some feature working, then it'll work, right? And and if not, uh, then then that that part of it is not going to be as well supported. So I think that's super observation, right? Just yeah, it'll never be done. Is uh, is the is the thing? Yeah, I I really like this idea of a reconstructathon. The name, not so much. I think I know where these mouthful expressions come from. <laughs> Uh, but we actually tried something like that. We had something called an M marathon uh, in Montreal and actually Adrian was there and we were working on some many projects related to the MRD. Yeah, we built the MRD viewer there. Yeah, so I, I think that's a great example. Um, I, I, I experienced it not so much in, in the, in the uh, image reconstruction field, but in I worked on healthcare interoperability for a while, and and I went to these uh, connectathons, and it was uh, it was kind of mind blowing. Like we developed whole products over a weekend, like not completed, but like you know uh, the, the the concepts and the ideas. And I thought that was uh, kind of amazing. And it's also a really good way to build community, right? So yeah. the, another critical thing here is is to understand that we're talking about standards and software and all this, but it's made by people, right? In the end, it's made by people and they have to get along and understand what each other's pain points are and, and sort of have a community feel to it. It sounds kind of mushy and soft, but it's really important, right? Is to get people together and get them sort of energized in this and I, I think we managed to do that a little bit because we had that workshop going when we started it right so everybody sort of got together and then we went hiking in Arizona and we talked about it some more and that builds a little bit of something that that persists still I think that's important so uh, I actually wanted to pick up on this interoperability aspect I mean you know that famous XKCD comic where it says there's 14 competing standards. We should have one that rules them all. And then we have 15 competing standards. I'll, I'll put yeah. it in the chat. Uh, are you competing with any standard? Uh, I think you're in a kind of a unique position that there's lots of kind of downstream standards, Nifty, Mink, Bids, but none of them deal with the raw data. And many, not many of them are aware that there is such a thing as raw MRI data. So what's your view? Are there any competitors? And if not, what is the interoperability aspect and is there any way to connect to make compatible MRD with all of these other downstream uh, standards? Yeah, uh, wow, that's a good question. Uh, uh, I, I don't think there are competitors and, and if there were, I wouldn't call them that uh, just because that's sort of a, a, an adversarial uh, sort of view of it. I would, but what I will say is that, so, I would say it this way, there are no published, openly available competitors like that, but there are competitors in every single lab. Every single lab has their own MATLAB scripts that 18 postdocs worked on uh, that you know, take their data from their scanners and turn it into this internal format that is only understood in this lab. So there are like all of these like little internal things. And we're in, there, there's some tension and competition in the sense that it, it is work on those labs to go and say, well, actually, now let's let's do it right. Let's let's well, do it right. Let's let's try the MRD standard instead, 
knowing that it's going to be some work for us and also knowing it will not be perfect. And, and for us to make it perfect for us, we sort of have to get into the community and, and contribute something upstream. That's work, inertia, energy, and things like that that have to be expended in these, in these labs to get involved. And it may not be small. And, and they're all under a lot of pressure, you know, to write new grants and, you know, uh, compete and all of this stuff, get their papers out. So it may not be high on their list to do. So I would say there's lots of like internal competitors uh, all over the place. But I don't think there's anything published quite like this. Uh, the only other open source project I'm aware of is .ra, which is for raw data arrays, MR raw data arrays. Yeah. yeah. So, but we actually looked at it pretty extensively when we started because there was a, the first thing we said when we had the little group, we said we should not make something that's there. And then we did a little excursion of about a week and we looked all over the place and is there something and we talked to different labs. Was there something that was already internal in the lab that we could just take and publish? And we didn't find anything. So we didn't sort of decide, oh, we're going to make a 15 standard just because we're better. We, 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 we did try to figure out if there was something already there and, and didn't find it. Um, so, so I don't think there is, there is something there, but I would, you know, and what about incorporating, uh, MRD into other standards? I don't know, as part of a JSON file or something that just kind of makes the whole workflow with derivatives, quantitative MRI maps, those kinds of things easier to incorporate the MRD format. Yeah. So, so I think, so we, there's this really, from a software perspective, this is really interesting, but the 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 image format for instance is something we created this there is the the uh, in the mrd standard there is this represent representation of an image and it always didn't sit right with me because there is dicom and there is uh, nifty and there is all this other stuff and why are we developing another way to represent an image um and so I always felt like for that part of the standard we should just pick something else but whenever we try to approach this it doesn't quite fit because most of these standards, they don't. So one of the things are like representing complex images in a, in a useful way. And so this data, this image format that we had internally, which was really meant as sort of an in, intermediate way of sharing images and passing them around, not as the final product. The final product would be DICOM or Nifty or whatever it is that goes into your, your part. But we need this structure that can represent and not complete uh, MR image and and that part of it we we always had in there but I always wanted to merge it with some other standard there or and have it sort of fit in and yeah I haven't completely let go of that pipe dream but but I haven't managed to make it work yet uh, so if somebody wants has some great ideas there that would be a cool cool thing to to uh, because I don't think we should invent another image format that said when we looked at like how do we, where do we store the data? So uh, Adrian talked about uh, HDF5 files and that's the file, kind of file container that we use, right? Uh, we actually thought about maybe we could just stick all this into DICOM files because then we can set it or send it around and we could just use DICOM as a container. But anybody who's worked with a 10 gigabyte DICOM file will, will know that that doesn't travel so well. And there's, there's a bunch of other problems. Uh, so we decided not to do that. And I'm glad we made the decision that we did, but, but we have sort of, tried to make it fit in but not quite been successful uh, on some of these things but yeah i've always thought maybe the images should just be nifty or something but it doesn't quite fit so i don't know adrian you guys have probably worked on this some more uh, too but um yeah i i've had the same thought process that that's the bit that doesn't fit that we would prefer to integrate with some other format but we have as michael said there's we haven't quite found the right fit yeah so well, I was I was wondering if we could um, go take it back slightly to one of the things that you, you said before about how a project like this is never done and how um, you know you, you have to always keep going and, and actually the vendors are always going to be changing their scanners and the raw data formats will be changing anyway. So how do you keep this is basically a live a live development and it will continue to be a live development. So how do you maintain something like this after the initial push to get it all sort of the, the first version, how do you keep it going? Yeah, uh, should I say something first, Adrian? Yeah, I don't know that mm -hmm. I have the answer, uh, but the challenge here uh, is that it is nobody's job, right? 
So there's always, uh, and, and that will always be the case when you start something grassroots, right? You're going to have this nebulous thing. And it's really nobody's job uh, to run it. Nobody works full time on this. And so, you know, it, it's in people's spare time and so on. And that, that means that your, your management of this will, 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 will suffer a little bit. But, but what you, the way that you keep it going is by people using it. When people using it, they experience what the pain points are. And then they will hopefully, when they come up with solutions for those pain points, be motivated to get, get back and contribute something into the community. I think the biggest challenge is that there are a lot of people uh, in labs and stuff around the world that make little modifications, quirky workflows and stuff around things that don't work quite well but they might be slightly intimidated about actually going in and contributing back to the project. So I wanted to, uh, this is again sort of a, a, a selfish segue here, but I wanted to encourage people to actually get out there and contribute some of these ideas back to the community. And I wanted to say a few things like, you don't actually have to come with like great code that we have people that write software and love writing software and that may, you know, we can have, very uh, vivid discussions about you know how things should be done and all that stuff but most of the time to drive this kind of project that's actually not what you need what you need are good ideas a good understanding of what is needed in the field what a lab needs which sometimes somebody who's not a postdoc or a phd student might understand a little bit better what does it take to maintain this when postdocs come and go and all these things that that happen in the lab so I would encourage people that have sort of leadership experience that want to drive the standards forward and kind of program management, project management skills to come in and help drive these ideas, structure it so that we have work sitting in front of us when new people want to come in and say, you can go do this thing. It's a simple little task. We need some documentation written. I think that's a big, pretty big one for us uh, right now. Right. So if you have any sort of urge to get in and get involved in this project just get out there and 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 do it and don't be too intimidated about all the software stuff that's going on we'll we'll, we'll figure out um, a way around that but to coming back to your question Shannon, how do you keep this going it's a constant struggle right constant struggle of keeping people engaged uh, and and staying in there and people come and go right i stepped out of this for a little bit i'm now a little bit more back into it and that's just the nature of things but but the the challenge the main challenge is really keeping critical mass and making sure that people understand that you don't need to be a software genius to have real real meaningful impact on this project yeah i think uh, as a user we keep it going because we use it for so many things and if we upgrade our scanner and we have a new software version we need to we need to deal with that we need to create a new converter that converts the data so that it looks the same as all of the MRD files that we already have. And so we put effort in to keep things going for our individual applications. And so I'm sure there are dozens of other labs who are also keeping things going for their individual applications, which are different than mine. Um, and as Michael said, what people come in with is their own knowledge of their application. They understand their data and their workflow and their application. And we centrally don't. And so if you can come in with that knowledge, that's really helpful for us to know what needs to be done. I think I see the biggest challenge is keeping some of the infrastructure modernized because it is nobody's job to keep up with the latest, um, the latest uh, modern infrastructure and choices of uh, how we develop these things. And so that is what I see as the biggest challenge, not necessarily the application side of things, but more the modernization of the core uh, of the framework. Um, and I'm also always surprised at conferences when I'm, I'm watching different talks and I see lots of different labs say, oh, we used ISM RAM RD for this project. And I'm constantly pleasantly surprised that there are so many people using it that I don't know. Um, so to all of those people, if you're using it for your own little projects, as Michael said, please talk to us because we, you, you can help us and we can help you. Yeah. yeah. So, so one, one advantage of getting, it's just so there's a little bit of incentive of getting out there and doing a little bit of the community work is if you have your specific workflows and, and features that you, you 
want to have supported. If we get it sort of into the main software repos and we continuously test that, there's a pretty good chance that it will then be, well, there's a better chance that it will get maintained. Everything falls apart eventually, right? But um, but that that's what I would really encourage. That, that would be the motivation, right, to get it in there, kind of leave your mark on it. Um, and the other thing is that that there, there are some experiences in working with this stuff that you probably will not get doing your day-to-day -day research stuff right not every not uh, not all of us want to be you know professors eventually right lots of uh, people in the field want to go and work in software industry or whatever there's a lot of experience that could be had from participating in these projects that you will probably not get in your uh, in your lab so that's a little bit of an incentive to to come out and and participate whether you write software or you just manage the project or 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 aspects of the project so that would be important well, we've been chatting for a while. Uh, uh, I think uh, at some point we'll uh, need, unfortunately, to wrap up. But uh, um, I, I think there is still some time to, to chat uh, if Nicola doesn't kick us out from his uh, chat room, hopefully. Not no, feel soon. free. Um, I think part of the reason why we are doing this uh, is to get people excited about uh, um, reproducible research practices and uh, today specifically excited about uh, uh, MRD and uh, more people getting on board using it. So um, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, some really cool projects that you've done thanks to MRD, something that uh, also some something specific uh, something that you said wow this was really nice i'm really proud of it uh, and uh, maybe also something that our viewers can uh, can replicate can play with at home adrian maybe you want to start yeah i think mrd and i think we haven't talked about this yet really enables us to share algorithms and share reconstruction code um in, in a way that we couldn't otherwise so it's not uh, sharing things is not just about the reconstruction code. We need a common data format that allows us to use it. And so for me, uh, the projects that I'm most proud of are when I've developed a technique and rather than just having it working in my own lab on 10 healthy volunteers, I've been able to share it really easily with collaborators at different sites all over the world. And they may be working on different, with different vendors, different software versions, different platforms, different data types, or slightly different data types, but they can take my reconstruction code and they can use it because we're using this common platform of the data. The other um, project that I wanna highlight is, is actually one of Florian's, which was the mrdata.org database that used MRD. And I think that was a, a that was um, a big project to take a lot of raw data and make it available to a lot of people from particularly machine learning applications and others. But again, I think that that's a great example of how having a common data format allows us to do some of these bigger community projects. Yeah, I, I can mention a, a couple of uh, things. So, so one, one recent thing was, uh, uh, I've been working a little bit with uh, some colleagues at, at Case Western on doing uh, some fingerprinting related uh, projects, uh, but they needed a way to, to do this with some remote reconstruction. And because we had the MRD format, we were able to stream it out. There was a lot of common infrastructure that could be shared. They actually managed to get up and running and reconstructing this uh, fingerprinting in the, in the cloud. Uh, I, I wouldn't say easily, nothing is ever easy, but but you know, with much less effort than it would have been going back a few years where we would have had to basically reinvent the whole bottom part of the stack for all of this. So there was just a lot of common software pieces to stand on and really made me feel like, okay, wow, this is actually is kind of useful. Uh, the other thing that I, other experience that I had was as I, you know, here at Microsoft, I've had to introduce new people to, to, uh, to work uh, in this area. And so, you know, I onboard an engineer on my, my team who's very, very senior software engineer, right? Who has lots of experience writing software. I could actually explain to him how to do image reconstruction and work with raw data without ever talking about, you know, sequences and instruments and how they work. Basically having a data standard that pretty clearly lays out, you know, what the fundamentals are and then just explaining some rudiment, giving him some rudimentary understanding of what case space is. He can now pick up this data and actually work on it and understand what it is and what the context is. So it creates this sort of contract where you can bring software people and 
MR physics people together. And I thought that was kind of a neat, uh, neat example of making a, a stand. That's exactly what a standard is supposed to do, right? It's supposed to allow us to bridge these different parts of our domains that don't normally speak the same languages, whether it's different vendors or even people with different parts of different kinds of skills, right? Uh, and bring those into the field. So I thought that was kind of neat. You had your hand up, Florian. Florian. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, uh, quickly chime in something what Adrian said. To give credit where credit is to mridata.org is not me. That was uh, from Mickey Lustig's group, particularly Frank on did all this. So I, I had nothing to do with it, but just since, since you mentioned it. But we also use the ISMRMD format for the fast MRI um, database. So. Um, so, so one thing I wanted to mention there, Florian, actually, uh, which so I've used your FastMRI dataset extensively, as as you know, and we've been in uh, this amazing resource. And uh, so you pick up this data, and then you look in there, and then it sort of looks and smells a little bit like ISMR MID. The header is in there and stuff, but it's actually not in in the sort of raw ISMR MID format, right? It's been pre-processed a little bit and put into some arrays which I think makes a ton of sense because of the way that it needs to be consumed for machine learning. But it, if I wanted to point to things that, what is it that we need to work on in the future? What is it that is missing from this uh, standard? I think something, so what, what the current version of the MRD uh, format is really great at is, is representing what took place in the experiment, but it probably doesn't lay, lay out the data extremely well for machine learning. Uh, because there's a bunch of, you have to trawl through all these profiles, figure out how things get set up and so on. And so thinking about kind of first class data structures that really enables us to work with this in machine learning would be uh, would be an area to work on in this format, right? Where we said, this is actually what, what are the current needs of our field, right? And so if somebody's interested in working on that, I would be very supportive and think that would be amazing. So it just, whenever I work with the fast MRI data, it makes me think about that there is this gap here uh, that we have this representation of the experiment, but not necessarily in the form that you would want to use it for, for doing uh, training for machine learning. So anyways, a side comment. Yeah, just a quick follow on it. I, I think you described it very well before the 80%, 20%. This is exactly what happened in this project. I think the ISMR MRD was 80% there. And then we just fine-tuned it and tweaked it to tailor it to the specific needs that we had, especially in light of the, of the challenges. So I'm not sure if you can unify this and make it perfect or whether letting the people who, who need to use it for machine learning um, tailor the, the last bit by themselves anyway. But it, but it could also just be guidance and it could be tooling, right? That says, okay, you have a bunch of files here in, in ISMRMID format, the sort of the real format, if you want to call it, but you want to prep it. You want to do some prep stage to turn it into something you can train over for machine learning. Here are some scripts, tools, and stuff that were written to operate on the standard and, and that will produce now a different you know, output, which we can then sort of decide how much of a contract is that, but that, that would be a great outcome too, right? So you guys did a lot of work there, as you say, to tweak and tune and, and get a little bit of stuff. And so if there was stuff that could be learned in the community and kind of uh, be contributed back there, that would be, uh, that would be awesome as well. But um, yeah, but, but I think it's a good example of, of using it, but then kind of molding it to your needs, right? Uh, which, which you usually need to do. Yeah, all right. Uh, fantastic. Um, what do you think, guys? Shall we uh, start to the wrapping up phase? Uh, maybe uh, Adrian and uh, Michael, any last words? What uh, would you like our? Uh, what would you like to leave our uh, viewership with? We would like to remind you to get involved. I, this is a fun project. Um, it, there's a lot of implications to it and a lot of opportunities to develop it further. And so if you're interested at all, please contact one of us. Yeah, exactly. So we, we meet informally uh, on a, on a semi-regular basis. Anybody who wants to join in that is welcome to, uh, yeah. to reach out to me. Uh, please 
uh, yeah, get just getting reach out to me, reach out to Adrian, anybody in the community, put an issue up on the GitHub repo saying you don't know where to find the uh, stuff and, and we'll, we'll, we'll engage with you. I just wanted to sort of hammer down one hammer uh, one more time. You don't need to write software to be involved in this project. In fact, if you're just in it, interested in herding cats, managing stuff, doing what we would call uh, PMing and, and, and stuff like that, there's a huge opportunity to do this here. And it's very important. It is just as important as writing the software is to make sure that all of these people that are running around with their own agendas, that they're actually turned into a spear and moving in one uh, specific, or we may change directions, but for a period of time, it's good to be moving in the same direction. So if you're interested in that, if you're interested in writing documentation, you can say, well, how would I write documentation? I don't even know how it works. That's actually a great place to start from, to write documentation, sit down, figure out how it works, write it down, and then work with us that are quote unquote experts, you know, on this to, to, that's a great way to get good documentation written is to have it be re-understood by somebody new and written down uh, is a very important thing. So whether it's project management, documentation, or writing code, or contributing stuff with your specific application, do do get involved. We, we need all, all sorts uh, to get involved in this. Awesome. We will put links in uh, the description of whatever platform we are going to publish this uh, podcast in, which we don't know yet. <laughs> As you hear, we are very uh, naive to all this, but I'm sure we will find uh, the best way to reach our viewers, uh, whom I would like to thank. Um, I hope that uh, you viewers and listeners uh, will be numerous. And I thank very much uh, Adrian and Michael and uh, Mathieu and the rest of the uh, Reproducibility Study Group Committee. It was a great experience and uh, see you next time. See you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for having us.